actually our presentation, even our presentation is going to be collaborative. Uh, we've got uh, Greg and Brian over here who will introduce more in a minute. Uh, our presentation is going to be a case study about uh, Greg Engel's uh, laser lab at the University of Chicago. So, uh, understanding the function of a space is critical when you're designing any system. But for a laser lab, a very high uh, performance precision laser lab, it's absolutely critical. So for a normal uh, office space like this, you could kind of get the mechanical design fairly close, maybe oversize it a little bit, dial things back with controls. Uh, but for a laser lab, it has to be absolutely perfect. And it's impossible to achieve that level of perfection with really having a detailed, intimate understanding of how the space is going to be used, what the uh, functions of the space are going to be. And it's impossible to really have that level of detail of understanding of the space without really intimately collaborate with the people who, use it, who are going to be the end users of the space, namely the scientists. So this is really going to be a presentation about that collaboration between um, uh, Greg from the University of Chicago and IBS and uh, Zentel and um, how we work together to develop this lab space. Um, and the lab space has proven to be a very effective, uh, useful space for Greg for many years. And also, uh, there was uh, quite a number of innovative solutions uh, that were developed during the course of this um, collaboration that have been used for dozens of lab spaces subsequently. Okay. So, I'm Joe Prusetto from Interactive Building Solutions. Uh, we design and build high performance uh, spaces uh, like laser labs and, and other spaces. Uh, Joe Joza uh, is actually the person from IBS who was actually collaborating with Greg and Brian, but uh, he couldn't be here today. And here's Brian. Brian, uh, do you want to come up and uh, tell a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Zentel? Sure. Oh, you can keep the microphone. I think I can talk loud enough. Is that good? Everybody hear me? Yes. Good. So I'm Brian Lee. I'm with Zentel Tech. And I can tell where I'm going to be for Super Bowl Sunday. So what do you think they would charge? Probably bring in some friends and some beers. Anybody have a problem? So uh, I'm the president, or as I like to say, the timekeeper, the floor sweeper, and uh, the uh, gopher for Zentel Tech. Uh, and we are a piping firm that we work uh, primarily in uh, large facilities, University of Chicago, Northwestern Hospital, Northwestern University, uh, things like that. And we are uh, a company that provides uh, solutions. Our uh, slogan is, we like to help make your mechanical systems better. And that's really what we try to do is make mechanical systems better. And uh, we met uh, Greg several years ago, and uh, we had a very good collaboration, which you're going to hear about. Uh, and we're really excited to have Greg here. And uh, uh, Greg, you want to talk a little bit about yourself and your science? Sure. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. I hope you can hear me in the back. We're good? OK. So I uh, am pleased to be here. This is a different audience than what I usually speak to. Uh, first of all, it's not 250 freshmen learning chemistry. Uh, but more importantly, you know, I travel all over the world uh, giving talks about our science. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about what we do. But what I don't usually get to talk about at those sorts of meetings is the secret sauce, what actually makes it work. Um, and the other thing that I don't really get to talk about is what sustainable means to a university professor. Um, I can tell you, you know, just in a word, it means tenure. If this doesn't work, then they're going to have to renovate my space and put someone else into it in seven years' time. So the questions of how long does something hold up, what happens with quality, it all gets ripped out, gutted, and rebuilt uh, about seven years later. 
Um, so our definition of sustainable is it's got to give you a capability that allows you to do something that no one else in the world can do. And that's kind of the baseline, and then you build from there. Um, what does that mean? It means that everything has to be a custom solution at some level. That's not to say every aspect of it has to be custom. Most of that's best practices. But you've got to do something really, really well in order to enable capabilities that other people don't have elsewhere. Um, and this is an issue. The other issue with it is you've got to get it right the first time. So you don't get two tries at this. In the back of any faculty member's mind, there's a tenure clock ticking. It's seven years, and then you're fired. Um, or you have a position for life. It's one or the other. There is no middle ground. So it's kind of it, it's a little challenging to think about working in that space. And when you come in, you're very good at what you do. You have some ideas of what, what projects you want to undertake and which areas are underserved. And you've got absolutely no idea how to build a laboratory. Um, or how to talk to people who build them. It's just something you've never done. Um, and that sort of sets the boundary conditions for how someone comes into this problem. And it's, in fact, exactly the service uh, that I lucked out, frankly, in getting uh, from uh, Zentel and IBS, uh, mostly because every other contractor we talked to said, we can't do anything like this. You need these guys. Um, and that worked out nicely. So, a little bit about what we do. I look at ultra-fast uh, electronic dynamics, and I look inside photosynthesis. Uh, it's about solar light harvesting, so the NREL uh, type of uh, example that we heard about before is really on point. We look at how plants have evolved to make use of quantum mechanics in their light harvesting. That sets some boundary conditions. It means you're going to have to look at things at a molecular level. It means that the time scales that you're going to look at are femtoseconds. So that's a millionth of a billionth of a second. So uh, if you think about the speed of light, that's about the time it takes the speed of light to move 300 nanometers or a third of a micron. Um, so that means that all of your distances, your timings, your scales, they have to be about a million times faster than the fastest computers, roughly. Um, and that's hard, as it turns out. Uh, that also means that if your laser table expands or contracts by a micron, you're done. You, you really need to keep it stable. It also means that if humidity changes and changes the index of refraction, that changes the time it takes your light to propagate down the laser table, and you're done, um, and things aren't going to work. Uh, now, there are ways around that. Uh, you can try and stabilize everything actively, but then your students become electrical engineers, and you never get any work done. And the biggest issue becomes one of productivity versus just you know, getting the science done. And, so if you're sitting there saying, you know, I need you to build this fancy electrical system, we need to stabilize things, we know our room is oscillating around, you can do that, but you're never actually going to get to your science. And the laser labs that I grew up in, you'd spend the first four or five hours of every workday tuning the laser, trying to make it work, and then you spend the ex next eight or nine hours of every workday trying to do your science, which leads to no sleep, but hey, grad students are 21 years old, they can deal with that. Uh, but, you know, it also means you only have about half the productivity. So if you can get this laboratory design right, you can be twice as productive, and you can do experiments that other people can't do. Uh, and in fact, we created some of the very first data to prove that biology makes use of quantum mechanics and manifestly quantum dynamics in its light harvesting. We created the first optical analog to MRI uh, in our group. We created the first femtosecond chiral uh, spectroscopy in our group. We can see things that no one else can see precisely because we have a laboratory environment that at the time no one else had, though uh, now you guys build them around the country. Um, which I'm both excited and bitter about when we all said it's done. Um, should be honest about it, right? Okay, so uh, you know, what is our goal? Our goal is understanding how you go out and you capture energy from sunlight and you use it to do what you want to do, which is pretty much anything but waste heat. You want to be able to uh, store that energy in chemical bonds, you want to use it for solar cells, and you just want to grab the energy from the photon and hold on to it. The technique shown doesn't work at all, but uh, you can do this. Uh, <laughs> Trust me, it can be done. Uh, but that's the idea. And what's it mean? Well, if you're going to do this type of very sensitive spectroscopy, you need a very well-controlled laboratory environment. You need the ability to dictate the temperature and have it be really stable. So about 0.1 degrees is workable. Uh, 0.05 is better. Uh, 0.2 is about what I had as a postdoc, and that's marginal. but you'll get by anything less than 0.2 uh, over the course of a few days and forget it. Um, and people have to be able to come in and out of that space. Lasers have to be able to turn them on and off. 
you have to have people working on things and you've got to be able to hold that tenth of a degree. Now holding two degrees, I mean my, my living room does that. that. That's not so hard. Uh, holding one degree, that's sort of like what my office does, and in fact the 400,000 square foot building that I work in can hold a degree. Uh, but getting down to a tenth or less uh, in an actively used space with a kilowatt of load plus people, and you know, some graduate students are brighter than others, but they're all worth about 100 watts uh, a piece when you get down to it. Uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, you know, I have a dim bulb joke too, but we're not going to go there. Uh, anyway, so. Um, you know, what do I need in a space like this? We need about a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit. We need about a half a percent of relative humidity. Um, we also are very sensitive to vibration. I mean, I have a table, it's a 6,000 pound table. It floats on a bed of nitrogen. It's pretty vibrationally isolated. The space itself uh, will do about uh, VCD. Uh, so it's decent vibrational space, but not spectacular. Uh, if I go to the sub-basement where some of my colleagues are, it's exceeds this day. But, you know, it's, it's a pretty good space. It's a pretty quiet space. Uh, we keep ourselves around uh, 40 or 50 uh, dBA, and it goes up a little bit when you start uh, measuring dBc, but it's not too bad. Um, so we've been able to do that. We have uh, clean room HEPA filtering. My students don't gown up. It's not a clean room. Uh, that's about productivity. If every time they have to go from their desk to the lab, they've got to put on a gown, I, I lose productivity. So we sacrifice a bit there, but it's a low dust environment. Uh, it could be operated as a clean room. Um, so this was. This was sort of the baseline, and I was able to tell people what we needed. You know, I was able to say to the University of Chicago and these guys, that this is what we have to deliver. I don't really care what the temperature is, but it's got to be stable. I don't really care what the humidity is, but it's got to be below 45% where my hygroscopic crystals get ruined, and it's got to be stable. How do we do that? And there are a lot of design decisions that go into this. So the temperature, not so bad. 70 is good. You don't want an uncomfortable lab. So that one's pretty easy. Humidity, do you want to try and lock it at 45%? Do you want to try and lock it at 30%? Uh, Chicago's a rough place to do this. When I was in Berkeley, California, and it was always 15 to 18% humidity outside, it was pretty easy to think about what's going to happen, except the month of December where it rains, which means you take off and go to the coffee shop or whatever libation you might prefer. Um, but in Chicago, you know, we have things like summer and winter, which California doesn't really have. And that makes it a much harsher decision. So we ended up setting the lab around 35% uh, based on the capabilities of the low temp water in the building and uh, some uh, reheating and energy uh, sustainability issues. So we picked about 35% humidity uh, with you know, plus or minus uh, about a quarter of a percent to give us the control band. And that was the goal. Uh, and in fact, those are three of my students working on one of the lasers uh, in the lab. Uh, now, What's it take to get there? And I think when I look around at my colleagues around the country, where do people fail? It's always in communication. The issue is always one of communicating the right things up front when you define the project, making sure the design team really understands what's happening. The handoff between the design and build uh, is often a mess. And this is the one that keeps faculty up at night. Because when you get to commissioning, which is often a third person yet, and something doesn't work, the answer you get is this. You know, the contractor says, well, I built what was on the page. And the designer says, well, my design was perfect. And the faculty member sits there and just looks at their watch and thinks about their tenure clock and goes home and cries. Um, and this actually takes years. So uh, I have a good friend at Penn. She's about fifth or sixth year. They're still trying to get her lab correct. Um, I have a friend at WatchU who lost all of his grants based on uh, a mistake by facilities, ruined his lab when it was rebuilt. He couldn't control well enough. And that was the end of his career for about seven years, and he had to switch what he did. Um, you know, and you compare that to a thriving lab, which turns over, I don't know, a million, million and a half of grant money each year, meaning about 400,000 donated back to the dean each year. It, you look at what it would take to do this well up front if you have the right planning, and it's a pretty good business case. Every new faculty member at a university like the University of Chicago costs about $3 million. It's about a million of renovations, it's about a million of startup, and it's about seven years of salary plus benefits plus overhead. So it's a $3 million investment when you go in to do this. And the actual amount of money that it takes to do it right, it's not that much. Taking a little extra time to do this is valuable. And so understanding how a scientist can talk to an engineer, develop the right set of specifications where you don't have things that go terribly wrong, um, one good example is in the building I'm in, we had a problem with low temp chilled water, or sorry, uh, process chilled water. Uh, someone said, you know, we need 80 PSI water pressure 
in order to supply our pumps. Sounds like a good specification, it's what we always had. Um, so we got 81 PSI supply and 79 PSI return. <laughs> Two PSI differential. We didn't specify it as a differential pressure, we specified it as absolute. Anyone, I mean, I'm seeing you frown. Anyone who hears that and knows what we're talking about knows immediately what the issue is. You need to be able to push the water through your instrument. <coughs> Two PSI differential won't do it, so 80 PSI of absolute pressure is useless to you. And there's sometimes where you think you're saying the right thing, and you get exactly what you ask for, and it's absolutely unworkable, and you only realize it when you go and you hook up the laser. Um, so this was Don Levy's laser. He was our vice president for research. He hooked it up, and he couldn't use it because it, it just didn't have any differential pressure to supply. These are the kind of things that happen all the time, and they happen a lot to young scientists. Because you haven't been around the block before, you don't know what can go wrong, you're doing it for the first time. So talking to an engineer who can really understand the scope of this, think about what you actually mean when you say something rather than just exactly what you say. So when you say, look, I, I absolutely need 80 PSI of water pressure. Okay, I mean, that's a true statement, but it's not really what you mean. What you mean is you need to push water through something with 80 PSI, so you need a delta. And it's just little things like that cause a big problem. This is, this is where I found IBS uh, and Zen Pelody spectacular. First of all, they, along with uh, two folks from the University of Chicago, Camila Garza and Felix Lean, flew out to meet me uh, in Berkeley. So Ryan Lee came out with me, Joe Josa came out. They looked at the lab there, they looked at what we were doing, they looked at the workflow in the lab that I had been in at Berkeley and said, okay, we understand what you need in Chicago. What are the biggest problems in this lab? How do we fix it? How can we make it better? Um, and you know, they had a lot of neat ideas, uh, most of which I didn't understand at the time, some of which I'm not sure I fully understand now, uh, but they work really well. Uh, he tries, he really tries to teach me. Um, but uh, it, yeah, anyway, that's my fault, not his. Uh, so you know, then there's also this aspect of designer versus contractor. So when we did this, we did a design build contract. Um, that, I think, was the best move that we made. And I had no idea we were doing this when I came in as a young faculty member. But the idea that the person who designs it is the one who builds it, is the one who commissions it, who's on the hook for the performance, and two years later, three years later, 12 years later, um, that's the person you go to to fix the thing if something goes wrong. Uh, we've had very few uh, of those sorts of issues, but nonetheless, you know, knowing that you have that really lets you sleep well at night. Um, and then finally, uh, project management versus performance. So Tom Deal in the back from the University of Chicago was a project manager on my third laser lab. We came in under budget. Uh, it performs really well. Uh, knowing that you get that right and working with contractors who have small change orders, uh, this is also a real benefit. Um, it doesn't really cause me to stay up at night, but it will cause him to uh, stay up at night. Um, and you know, then finally, you know, when you sit down and you think together about what it's going to take to solve this, having different types of people in the room and really having a back and forth about what can you make, what's the cost of this, is there an easier solution, what's going to be necessary, what are you most worried about, how do we mitigate those risks? That was also extremely helpful. Uh, and there were clever solutions. Um, some were brute force, some were just simple material selections over on the carpentry side. You know, putting plastic behind the wallboard just to make sure that you don't have humidity from adjacent spaces. As it turns out, the laboratory I'm in, where I need this humidity control, the guy next to me works on granular materials, and he must, must, must have his humidity over 60% year-round. <coughs> so I run a 35% lab. He runs a 60% lab. And, you know, he's a wonderful guy, but we are not good neighbors. This is not a wise thing to do. On the other hand, for a roll of polyethylene behind the drywall, it works perfectly. You, know, you don't build that into the controls, you just physically build a vapor barrier. It's not real hard, but it fully mitigates these issues. We have a slurry wall on the other side, you do the same thing. Um, if the drywall is not up, it's very, very easy to staple up polyethylene, overlap it, glue it, and call it done. Um, so we're pretty watertight, as it turns out. Um, actually, we're really watertight because when one of your contractors hit a sprinkler with a torch, uh, it really fills with water. <laughs> um, not his fault, by the way. Um, so, anyway, the uh, some of these solutions, some of the things that we did to get this type of control, how you go that last mile, everything is the final mile, getting to a degree, getting to a percent, not so hard, getting to half a percent or a tenth of a degree is tough. So with this, you know, we recirculate the air a little bit. 
Um, it makes, you know, from an energy efficiency standpoint, this is a win. For a laser lab where you don't have a whole lot of dangerous chemistry going on, it's safe. Um, we can make sure that it's zoned properly. It lets you wring out the water to get humidity control. They're relatively simple solutions to this. <coughs> Putting a PID loop on your heating and cooling coils to make sure that you know the temperature of your coil, not merely the temperature of your water. So you might, you know, if you want to run a 70 degree lab, thank you. If you want to run a 70 degree lab, you may well want to run an 81 degree uh, cooling coil. And if you turn something off, you might need to move it to 80.2. And having that PID loop that controls the coil very accurately uh, is extremely good. It divorces you from the changes in your steam plant or small changes from 150 to 155 degree water. You don't really care. Uh, it works out very, very well. And then you have to do, deal with the controls, which of course are more complex, but with separation of time scale, it works out very well. Um, you know, understanding how to monitor these things. This is also important. Making sure that you're watching the lab in the right place, which is typically right above the laser table. Um, that's important. Making sure the bottom skin of the laser table is the same as the top skin of the laser table so the whole thing doesn't bend. I mean, yeah, sure, it's three tons of steel and it's 18 inches thick, but it doesn't take much for this thing to warp or stress uh, or show torsional strain, and that'll also ruin your experiment. Uh, so there are a lot of these types of things where they really help. Where in the lab do you put the laser table? How do you make this like an air curtain? How do you ensure that you are as stable as possible at the laser table um, while maintaining a clean environment? Do you push the air down on the table, or do you push it down on the sides and suck it up over the table? What's the right way to do this? So there were a lot of airflow uh, considerations. There were a lot of issues of resonance to make sure your ducts aren't going to vibrate. Because you can hear things down to about 30, 40 hertz, but my table resonates at 10 hertz uh, in one direction and about 2 hertz in the other. And so any little bit of rumbling will affect hey, these types of. Sorry. Um, so any, any little change is going to affect the, uh, the performance of the system. Uh, and then also there's sort of other aspects that I never thought about when you're running a lab, which is you know, being nice to your neighbors. Making sure that you're not, you know, or that they're nice to you, sucking things in from neighboring rooms or blowing your air out into neighboring spaces. Uh, thinking about the noise from your air handlers and where you actually put these things. I mean, when you go into a chemistry lab, I mean, you're, there are a lot of things you worry about, most of which involve safety or uh, actually getting the work done, but you don't think about where is the air handler for this space. You don't think about, you know, is it vibrating above my table or not. So figuring out where to put these, how to use office spaces and neighboring labs as ante rooms and airlocks, uh, understanding the pressure schemes and how we're going to monitor those down the road. Uh, a lot of that came in and I just never thought about those. And then little things, just you know, balancing the different ducts to make sure that you don't have the same airflow everywhere and you get slightly different resonances. And that can go from how you hang them to how you size them to how much linear velocity you put through the different ducts. So there are a lot of neat, a lot of neat sort of things that went into that, um, all of which worked, uh, which is why I'm here to tell you about it. Uh, and then if you look at the lab, this is what it looks like. So this is what happens when I ask my students to step out of my photo. Normally they're, they're in there. Uh, but you can see uh, many aspects up at the top. You can see some of the supplies around the edges. You can see that perforated return uh, above the laser table. That's what that six ton laser table looks like floating on a bed of air. So if you walk up to it and you push on it, the whole thing kind of floats and jiggles. Uh, so it's you know, three tons, but just floating there. Um, and then you've got you know, million, million and a half dollars of equipment sitting on the top. You also have all your chillers and heat producing appliances in a separate air conditioned soundproof space. Uh, also where you can lock your students if they misbehave. Um, and you know, it, it works really well. You know, this idea of putting the air down around the sides and pulling it up through the center, exactly the opposite of what you would do in a surgical theater. I mean, it's just absolutely not what you do in what I would call sort of the second most controlled space that you might typically find. Uh, so if you walk through the city of Chicago, it's going to be laser labs and surgical theaters where people think about this type of cleanliness, clean rooms as well. Uh, but you know, it's, it's just the opposite model from what most people do, but it keeps the bottom skin and top skin of that table exactly uh, in tune, so you really get excellent performance. Um, and it also means that your heat producing equipment that you set up on this laser rack right here, the heat just gets pulled off. So you turn on an extra oscilloscope or something, and you're not blowing that change in heat right down onto your laser table, uh, which is very important. Because when you're working in these labs, as compared to 
telling people to get out of the way from a photo that I took, probably was a mistake. Um, you know, the, when you're working on, you're turning stuff on and off. There are changes that are happening above the table with monitoring equipment. You have people coming in and out. You really want to try and isolate your table from all of those different things. This airflow does that very, very well while maintaining a clean environment. Um, so this is the basic structure of the lab. Uh, the way we got here, uh, thinking about the innovation, thinking about clever solutions, thinking about how we would actually arrange furniture in the lab. I didn't expect that my HVAC team was going to tell me where and how to place my laser table and which shape it should be and which way it should face in the space. I mean, that, that wasn't sort of inside the envelope of what I consider an HVAC. On the other hand, it was absolutely crucial to design the system to exactly match the placement. Um, so just knowing that up front, so we're considering the right things in the right order, is extremely critical to success uh, of this project. Also compromises. Everything in science is a compromise. Any time you try to do something well, it means you're not paying attention to something else. There's always this aspect of where you spend your time and how you optimize. I didn't quite understand when I was coming in and making demands about a lab uh, that there are, of course, compromises in every other domain as well. Uh, I mean, I really can be that ivory tower academic with the blinders on. Um, frankly, it's kind of fun sometimes. But, but, you know, there are a lot of compromises that go in. If you do something, what else do you give up? If you really care about temperature and humidity, how much are you willing to give on, say, a dust specification or on uh, vibration? And vibration. These things matter. Um, and so understanding where the soft points are. Not every laser lab has exactly the same needs. Sometimes, you know, if you're not ultra fast, you don't care as much about the humidity. Just below 45% will be fine, but 30% is the same as 38%. It's no problem at all. If you really care about those timings, then suddenly it puts a really tight control band on that. So being able to talk to people about what you really need as compared to say, hey, just make a copy of that, can really change the cost. And we've had a number of people come into our building who have taken this type of thing as a base system and said, yeah, I don't need this, but I need that. I really care about magnets. I really care about temperature, but not humidity. How can we do this? Can we zone it differently? I want more small experiments, not one big experiment. My experiments are naturally small, and his are huge, but it doesn't really matter. You know, so thinking about how you might do this uh, is important. So different people have different needs. Uh, and that's something else that really became clear uh, in this process. Um, and it's one of the reasons why I like working with this team. Uh, the other thing, of course, uh, which I think to answer some of the questions, which would be inevitable at this point, is you know, how does it work? So when you go into this space and you work on it, you know, what type of performance can you actually expect uh, in the laser lab? Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you put in a photo. This isn't my picture, by the way. Uh, yeah, maybe it's thanks, mine. Thanks, guys. That shows how we got to California. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you you want to a couple? Yeah, so, you know, we had to deal with Rick, okay? And he's like really smart. And uh, so he really, really dumbed down his speak. And we got a little bit smarter and we talked and we talked at a level that we could both understand. And, you know, he, he claims that it was this great uh, thing that we went out to see his lab. And really, the, the backstory, Greg, is, hey, Fisherman's Wharf is out in San Francisco, isn't it? And let's go there. So, you know, that's how we ended up in California to see Greg. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. And the thing that we find with Greg, and we're starting to find more and more, because there's a lot, of more, a lot more researchers that are starting to do collaboration, is Greg can speak in terms that we understand as designers, and we then can give him really what he wants. And we have, uh, we're doing a lab uh, in another state right now that uh, unfortunately the researcher can't speak our speak, right? And, but uh, they have a translator there. They have another professor that speaks our speak. And so they could- speak, you mean mechanical. Mechanical speak, speak right, mechanical speak and can put things in terms that we understand to make it better, right? And so, you know, those types of things happen. And uh, having Greg as an ally, and having the ability that the University of Chicago, this is kind of a first for them to say, okay, we know you guys can do what you say, and you won't tell us, you'll tell us if you can't do it, so we're gonna take a chance and we're gonna 
put you guys together, and it's been pretty great. So, so, can, so another aspect that uh, I think I want to talking to both of you. Uh, so, what happens that causes a lot of these problems is um, the scientist says, like you were saying, I need this, 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 and. The contractors scratch their head and they go and do their best to deliver those items, but they never there, there was never any feedback going back saying, well, it, this, this is going to be very hard. If you do this, it's going to be at the expense of this. We could make the project a lot less expensive if we could sacrifice. What do you say? And I think that it, you know, it, it, I think you were saying in terms of these compromises us being able to communicate what the results of these compromises and give, inform you so you could know which decisions to make. You always made the decisions, but we informed your decisions. And I think that, that seemed like it was also very critical. Right. And, and let's all be straight, because if Craig knew how to sour pipe, <laughs> yeah, that, he wouldn't need us. That's not, that's not entirely true. But you know, I think what Joe says is actually very important. The idea that you know, often what the faculty member says to what they need creates a list of specifications. Then we have wonderful people in our facilities department. They're going to go contract on those specifications. Someone's going to deliver exactly what you wrote. And no one's going to come to you and say, you sure you really mean that? Is, that? is that really what you want us to do? We should ask before we do. You never get that feedback. And occasionally, you should just go, Oh, that wasn't what I meant. The 80 PSI is a brilliant example of this. If someone would have just said, are you sure that's really what you mean? That conversation and uh, you know, 10 years of mess would have been over in about 30 seconds. Uh, but for that conversation, we built an entire 400,000 square foot building on the wrong specifications and had nowhere easily to fix this so that it took many years of subsequent remediation projects to fix what should have been a 30 second conversation. So having that back and forth really matters because faculty have no idea what they really need. Um, and, but they have a good sense of being practical in the lab. So when someone tells you that, you know, look, if you do A, it's going to hurt B a little bit, and are you sure you want to do it that way? You can say yes or no, uh, or ask for more information, and that, that can be really useful. So having the faculty members talk to uh, the engineers helps immensely. Um, and then you get fewer surprises down the road in the project, which helps people in facilities. Uh, I wanted to bring up one other thing if we go back yeah. to that slide. Except, I, again, I've been, was, I've been trying to uh, oops, pump, pump these two for information. So, I think. Sorry. I'm going, I'm going through the rest. Of it. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Yeah. One of the crucial <laughs> things that uh, you know, I think Brian brought out in this is that um, <coughs> the commitment of IBS and uh, Zentel to this project. Like, we weren't just, we have to fill this specification and get on to the next job. These two, by doing this design build model, our companies were 100% engaged and tied in. We were going to redo things, redo them again, do whatever it took to deliver the solution that was necessary. And that, that commitment, I think, is also critical of you know, some of the innovations that we ended up coming with, uh, up with weren't the first try. Right? And, uh, I don't know, we can, we, we're, we're limited on time, but if uh, we have a table back there, I'm sure Brian uh, could tell you some of the, you know, some of the efforts uh, and iterations we went through to ultimately uh, get the solution we were after. And, you know, on the point of performance, uh, you know, so this, I, I pulled this up because this is now four years into uh, this lab. This was the first time after four years that I had to call IBS and say something's terribly wrong. And the answer to that is, you look at this green line, we're up to 0.19 degrees of standard deviation in one of my two labs. That's because a neighboring lab went in down the hall and it affected our building-wide chilled water system, but we needed to retune. Now the other lab that was a little closer to it didn't get affected much. So that one's still running at uh, about, uh, you know, 0.09. Uh, Why don't you dis uh, sorry. describe what the key is? Yeah, so sorry. The y-axis here is temperature. So I go from 70.4 to 72.6 on the top. This is going from Christmas Day to uh, 
to uh, January 29th, so it's a little over a month. Uh, so for that month, in the first lab, the red curve uh, is showing a standard deviation of 0.091 degrees. You can see that people come in, there are occasional things where someone turns something on, they're running the water, they're uh, leaving the door open while they're bringing stuff in and out. Um, and it causes some deviation from 71.8 almost up to 72, and then they shut it and things get better. Uh, but that lab's running well under 0.1 degree. The other one, I mean, the reason I was calling, so this is, this is what a disaster looks like. This is 0.2 degrees. That suddenly this lab that had been doing really well is about, you know, 0.2 degrees, and that's just way uncharacteristic. Um, when things are running well, uh, it looks much, much better. So now we're sitting at about 0.05 degrees across the largest outlier, uh, which is actually, uh, you know, next to a piece of, uh, uh, it's the fifth position on my table that I monitor. It's right next to a piece of key producing equipment with the cameras up to 0 0.1 uh, degrees. Um, and this, this curve goes for about, uh, about a day and a half. So this is the length of a typical experiment. So over the course of the experiment, we hold about a 20th degree. Uh, I monitor at 16 points around the room every 30 seconds all the time. So when something starts to get really out of whack, we can always uh, pull it up. Um, for about nine years, I had that live on my website anytime anyone in the country wanted to click on it and just see what's happening in the lab today. Uh, you could do that. They recently, uh, Perl updated its MySQL engine, so I have to recode. Um, so for the last year or two, I haven't gotten to it because I've been doing other things. Uh, but this thing just sits there, it's rock solid. Um, we also have other building monitoring through the actual uh, building automation services in Chicago. These are just my private monitors. So they, have, they run 83 points of uh, control over the course of the air handler. Those are all logged for about a month at a time for building automation. So we can always look at the past month and see what's going on. Uh, I store all the data from 16 points around the lab just to make sure that I can watch it uh, every 30 seconds and diagnose. And then sometimes what my students will do is they'll take one of these probes and move it on to something and see if they, you know, they see a fluctuation that's correlated. Can they figure out what's driving it? Can they put it on the chiller? Can they put it on the camera? They can put it on the laser. See what's actually producing the curve that's causing the room to move around a little bit. Um, so they, they play with them sometimes. So if you watch the website, you see something go wildly wrong on one of the probes, you can pretty much bet the student had it in their hand for a few seconds and then put it down on a chiller and you watch it go from like, you know, 70 to 95 down to 40 or something. That's not the room. That, that's, that's, you're measuring the body temperature of my student before they stick it on my chiller. Uh, but they use these as tools. They use these as diagnostics. It's that important to our experiment. Uh, so that's why we run these types of things. Um, so yeah, I thought it was. I thought it would be useful to show you, you know, what happens when it goes wrong. You know, what normal performance is, and then also, you know, when we're really doing a run and we want to be careful, uh, it's about 0.05. If you look carefully, you'll actually see the digital noise in my uh, A to D. That is my temperature probe. It's a Sensotronics uh, server temperature probe. So, uh, you know, we're down at that basically level that I can measure with the noise of these particular thermistors, they're, they're cheap thermistors, and it's a cheap temperature solution. But the room performs, uh, the performance of uh, And this is more or less what uh, allowed me to make my career. The fact that when we have this thing working, my students can come in each morning, turn on the laser, and it's just going to work. And they can get right to work and work and do science all day. And when they turn it off, it's going to be back there the next day. So my very first students came in, and before we published our first paper, uh, you know, they came and said, well, everything's running. Tomorrow morning, we're going to start uh, you know, taking data. And I just nearly fell out of my chair. Because you know, when, when I took the data that got me the job at the University of Chicago, when things started running at 5 PM, I stayed there for another 67 hours collecting the data. Because you don't go home when the laser's running, because something's going to break. And we went for 67 hours, and then something broke, and that was what we had to try and publish papers. Uh, here they just said, well, it's all working. We'll come back tomorrow. And I just thought to myself, OK, they've got to learn this lesson at some point. I'm going to let them do it. Better that they learn. And it's never going to work the first time anyway, right? So it uh, comes back in the next morning. Everything's still exactly where they left it. It's beautiful. Uh, I'm glad that I didn't yell at them about it because they think that's just the way the world always works. Uh, that paper now has about 1,000 citations uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is one of the top US journals. The average paper in that journal has about 18 citations for reference. Uh, so it was a solid paper. It worked pretty well. That's a, you know, 50 times more popular than their best papers. Uh, you know, so it's, it worked well. Um, they were able to do that. And the reason they were able to go home and come back is because this behaves this way. And it does it day in and day out. That's not to say there isn't the occasional bad day. 
We actually held our half percent humidity when our contractor flooded and put an inch of water on the bottom of our room. Um, so the good news is it's pretty robust too. That was a bad day, by the way. Just if anyone's wondering, that, that, is, that is my definition of a bad day. Um, but, uh, but from a humidity standpoint, you don't see it in the plots. Uh, it was just a little like uh, it, it was bad. Um, but this system really works. Uh, and that, that's the message that I wanted to uh, give, is you can build these systems. It takes a lot of collaboration between the university, the facilities department, the academic side, the contractors, and the designers. But if people are really willing to talk and work with one another, there is a lot of room to do some pretty extraordinary things. Uh, and there's a lot of room within this design to optimize it. So this worked beautifully for what I had. Uh, you know, another colleague of mine moved to U Chicago from MIT, and his demand at the university was just build me a lab like that. That's, this is what I want. Um, and you know, so it's a good advertising aspect, too. It's a way that we can really sell the expertise in the city of Chicago on a nationwide scale and bring people here and make Chicago a destination, uh, which is useful. So thank you guys very much for your attention. I appreciate it.
presentation for some of our people. Sure, we can. Sure. Okay, we'll talk about that. Yeah, and, and, and also, Marvin, on your, uh, kind of on the same topic, uh, so depending on, because we've been around the country, so to speak, and depending on where you go, the, the uh, facilities group or the engineering group could be either welcome, my friends, or they could be, ah, we got guys that could do that. And, and so they have that thing going, that dynamic going, and then you also have the, the fact of, you know, somebody like Greg says, yeah, I need plus or minus 0.1, and they say, 0.1, point half, yeah, yeah, whatever. And they, they, they kind of uh, make it look like it's a high performance lab. And then, like Greg said, the only thing that suffers is a professor's tenure. And then they're done. Right. When they're not operating, a lot of things can look pretty clean. And so usually when you're doing the commissioning, before you have people coming in and out of the stuff's working, they always look great. Yeah. But you know, this is why I showed you data from four and seven years after the fact. Uh, we're showing you data from yesterday, but for that pearl operate on my SQL code. Yeah, one of the things we've instituted, uh, we, we intentionally put server systems just to see how they respond to yeah. perturbations. So uh, we're really looking at that pretty closely. I don't know if people did that, how quickly you I We unintentionally perturb our systems and get out the same <laughs> data. So we, we look, that's one of the reasons yeah, I collect data all the time, is to look at that response so, function. As you know, we run 24 7, so we, we have to use One of the issues is, is they're shutting up their experiment going in and out of these mm -hmm. stations. We have to look at that as a perturbation, how quickly we can recover because it keeps them from, from utilizing their, their research. Mm -hmm. uh, the is a lot of the effort to keep put short. A lot of the details of this is getting this whole space to be entirely stable. Gosh, you gotta know your user. 
And it, I would say that you, know, you just got to talk to people. And in any organization, there will be someone who cares and understands about what you do. And there will be people who really just want the output and either don't have the time, the bandwidth, or the capability to communicate it clearly. And somehow you need to have someone who's a go-between. Whether that person works for you or works for us, I have no idea. Um, I don't really know how you build those bridges. It takes effort. Um, and there are a lot of people on my side of the fence who aren't really willing to put in that level of effort. Uh, they're worried about other things, quite frankly. Uh, they don't view this as their job. They view this as something facilities should provide them. Um, that's not altogether wrong, but you can't provide it if you don't have that stream of communication. So you need to find the right people in an organization to do that. I imagine it takes a certain amount of looking. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I think at some level I answer that you guys have to come to us. Uh, just because there are a lot of people on my side of the fence who aren't going to engage willingly uh, with you until it's time to do one project. That would be the one and only project they do in their life. So they're really not good at it. Wow. 
alum that you know try and fill their tenure and put them into a space and say, this is what's going to happen to you in another year or two when you leave the nest. And I think an IS, I2SL event would be really, you know, a good combination of the two coming together. Although so we have to. Event, plan events. <laughs> uh, I actually think Argon is an excellent bridging organization for this. It's a place that has a lot of young scientists that are going off into the world, has amazing engineering capabilities, and has PIs who actually collaborate with their facilities and engineering groups. And I mean, I, I would sort of point at Argon as a broker for this. Well, we've reached out over the years to the different universities. I have to say that I know everybody's busy, but it would be nice if you collaborate. There's a lot of work in your, in your facilities organization to support your science that we're already doing at Argonne. And, and, and uh, that the information that can be conveyed, I don't know who you're pointing to. I'm pointing to Tom Neal on the back of the blue shirt. So you can wave, Tom. Uh, and I got Tom, <laughs> we can talk if you'd like. Uh, but, but it would be nice if we could bring more more people like you into, into meetings like this because this community needs to hear these things too. So learning experience for us. Um, sometimes we're not always aware of these disconnects and, and, and language or, or information I mean, ambiguities that are occurring. It's interesting. The way I became aware of most of these is not actually so much through my project because after this worked, I just started getting phone calls from people all over the country who I haven't met saying, how did you do this? Yeah. Let me tell you what happened to me. And uh, you know, some of these people, their role in life is certain more than others. Um, and that really caused me to integrate a lot of these things uh, because this project just worked smoothly, um, not because of any particular skill of mine. Does anyone have questions? physicists and chemists have to coexist with biologists. The biologist brings his minus 80s, his minus 40s, his uh, centrifuges, who have put all sorts of electrical interferences into the line. So I was sort of curious, how sensitive was that laser to the quality of electrical power? Did you have to win any special? So I mentioned to you that I work on plants. So I have in the answer that is a minus 80 freezer, I own also centrifuge and a regular centrifuge. I isolate all my own proteins. In addition, I live in a building where one wing is all biology, and then my space is shared jointly with physics and chemistry, and the top two floors are just organic chemistry. So I live this every day, both in my group, where I have biologists, physicists, and chemists employed, as well as in my building, where we mix all those disciplines. Uh, so the electrical systems of those lasers, because they're diode pump solid states, they should nominally be pretty, pretty uh, isolated from electrical noise from the other systems. Yet, we have two power supplies in the building. We have a clean and a dirty power. So all of those freezers, et cetera, should be out on the dirty circuit. Whether everyone's a good citizen or not remains a little bit questionable. I also use medical grade isolation transformers uh, on my critical power supplies in order to try to do a little bit of cleanup uh, at the end. Um, but you know, anyone who delves into that, that's not a real great solution. It's a little bit more like flailing than it is a silver bullet, uh, but we try. So you do have separate clean and dirty power? Yes, in the building, in the entire building, yes. But it doesn't really, the biologists don't know what the point of clean and dirty power is. And why would you put something into the dirty power? That sounds kind of messy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, so there's a learning curve there. We educate our colleagues. And I've spent a lot of time going around with spectrum analyzers and antennae looking for various uh, RF sources and whatnot uh, in the building for some colleagues and occasionally for myself, usually because I've been accused, but I've never been the culprit. Um. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.